Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our next Calm Tax Combo. Now, of course, this series of webinars started a bit over 12 months ago with the onset of COVID and, of course, all the different stimulus packages that were announced out there. So our Calm COVID Combos have evolved now into our Calm Tax Combos. Let's keep it casual. Let's keep it practical. Let's keep it calm. But let's make sure we have those technical discussions that we need to have. Now, of course, our topic today is tax planning. 30 June is sneaking up on us incredibly quickly. So let's um, have that discussion now about what else you can do to minimize your tax as we lead into 30 June 2021. Of course, joining me today, we have Rebecca Mahalik from our Sydney office. Thanks for joining us again, Rebecca. Thanks for having me again, John. And our head of tax for Business Depot, Jackie Reeves. Thanks for joining us, Jackie. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. Now, let's just get straight into it, hey? And I wanted to start, I suppose, with a big quiz, big picture question. And that is around, you know, what is tax planning versus, I suppose, the, the not so good thing of, of tax evasion? Um, Rebecca, how would you respond to that question, I suppose? Well, uh, tax planning is really just around arranging your affairs so that you pay the minimum amount of tax that's legally applicable to you and tax evasion is all the other stuff that could potentially end you up in jail anything to add to that jackie that's pretty good summary really isn't it yeah pretty good summary i think we want to have tax planning um, so that we can plan for the unexpected and to minimize tax in the best way we can and we're doing it in advance knowing what the legislation is and i mean no one wants to pay a dollar more tax than they have to and that's what tax planning is about Obviously, there's a bit of compliance and there's a bit of documentation, um, which is obviously an important part of tax planning, making sure we've got that documentation and everything in place. It's really hard to save tax after 30 June passes, which is why 30 June is always such a hard deadline that we have to work with. Now, of course, one of the biggest things in tax planning to reduce the tax in a particular period is about pushing income out into the next year or about bringing expenses forward. Um, Jackie, what are the common ways that you see people, um, I suppose, get that benefit in a legitimate way? Yeah, okay. So I think the first thing is, is to, I guess, understand whether you're on a cash or accruals basis. Um, because if you're on a cash basis for accounting and for tax, then it's realistically going to be anything that you receipt or anything that you pay is going to be brought to account as income or an expense. Whereas where we can impact some of those timing issues is if you're on an accruals basis. So not received by cash, you're accruing income or you're accruing expenses. Um, <clears throat> so I guess prepayment of expenses, um, we saw in the budget that um, the prepayment rules have been updated to um, you being able to immediately deduct um, anything that's greater than 12 months, or so, sorry, 12 months, I think, if it spreads over two financial years, but that is now up to people with a $50 million turnover. So I think that's a good um, a good tip for this year is to remember expenses from 1 July 2020 um, probably can come in under those prepayment rules. We used, we used to be restricted only businesses with below, I think, $10 million was it, Jackie? That's right. Could well, actually prepayments pay. allowed by law. Yeah. yeah, so they've changed that threshold now. So 50 million, just to re-emphasize that. Yeah. Yep. What about income, Jackie? You know, often I get asked by clients who they've invoiced somebody for um, some services that they haven't delivered yet. Is there any way that we can push that income out into the next year? Yeah, so determining whether your income's earned is all going to be um, determining as to whether you've got to repay it. So if you're on a... Um, a fix, a, like a contract for service and you haven't performed those services and something happens midway through those contracts and it ceases, then you don't have to, and you've got to refund those monies, then basically you don't have to bring income to account. Um, but if you've received the money in advance and there's no refund applicable under your contract, then you've pretty much got to bring it into account in that financial year. And of course, again, we're assuming that your entity, that your business is on an accruals basis there. Correct. Because if it's cash basis, it wouldn't matter anyway, would it? That's right. And all we're talking about here is timing differences, isn't it? We're not actually changing the overall sort of tax. We're just pushing it out. Um, with yes. the exception, I suppose, we've got a change in company tax rates again at 1 July this year, where it drops from 26% um, down to 25% at, at 1 July this year. So I suppose if you're in a company structure, the um, tax deduction is worth that a little bit more um, if you have it before 30 June, but we're only talking 1%. Can't get too excited. Right. Yeah. Um, Rebecca, what about bonuses for staff? 
when can they be deductible, even if maybe you haven't paid them before 30 June? Around bonuses, it's all about whether or not you're actually committed to paying them. And so that's whether or not the employees have actually earned the right to the bonus and it's been communicated to them as well. Um, you can't just accrue it on your account. There actually has to be a commitment to pay it to the employees. So Jackie, could that be like a profit share arrangement or something that maybe is documented in your employment agreement? I think it would, but I think you'd have to you'd have to look to the nitty gritty of the agreement as to whether it says, okay, well, we just need to determine profit, but you know you're going to get 3% of profit and that's agreed and we're communicating that to you before end. I think you'd want to be really careful though, because you do, as Rebecca said, the employees have to have an entitlement to sue for that bonus. So that's what gives you the right to the deduction on the accrual. So I think it's just maybe monitoring some of those schemes pre-30 June to make sure that, that you have done the correct notification to employees. Of course, now the, the biggest topic of discussion in tax planning this year and probably last year um, is the temporary full expensing of capital um, or plant and equipment that you purchased. Um, this replaced the instant asset write-off that we had previously. Um, Jackie, take us through how that temporary full expensing deduction works. Okay, so I just will take this in two steps, John, because we still do have instant asset write-off for a period of time. So 1 July to budget night, which was 6 October, is still the instant asset write-off, the limit to 150000 whereas assets purchased from 6 October onwards, um, and in the recent budget that got announced to be extended to 30 June 2023. But if you want the um, full expensing in FY21, so it's got to be installed ready for use by 30 June 2021, there's no limit on those assets um, and you've just got to have a turnover of less than five billion. So I think most of our attendees on this webinar would have a turnover of less than $5 billion. Yes, so pretty correct. much everybody should be able to get an instant or an, an, a temporary full expensing of these items. That's um, right. I was go, just Jeff. going to chime in there and say, if you've got a turnover of less than 50 million, then it can be secondhand or um, pre-ordered assets. So there is a little bit of a quirk in that for businesses with a medium turnover of 50 mil. Again, I suppose I want to emphasize here, this is really just a timing, a timing benefit again, in that if you have a piece of plant and equipment and you would normally be depreciating it over five years, you would have got that deduction over five years. All this is doing is bringing the deduction forward so that you get 100% of the deduction at one point, at, at this particular point in time. We've got a question um, on the chat. Um, maybe I'll ask you this one, Rebecca. Where does the car depreciation limit um, sit in terms of full expensing? The car depreciation limit and luxury car limits aren't impacted by the full expensing deduction. They're still, sit, they're still in place under the usual rules. So, so we only get a deduction up to the luxury car limit. That's right. So I can't claim the new Maserati that I want, unfortunately. You can't? Why not? <laughs> well, and, and of course, the downside of that is you might get deduction up to the luxury limit. I think it's about $57,000 at the moment. Is that about right, ladies? Yeah. Yep. yep. You right. might get that deduction. But then if you've bought that within your business entity, we'll have fringe benefits worked out on the gross value of the Maserati in that example. I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's the car Mark had in mind when he, when he asked that question. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please pop them on the Q&A um, at the bottom and we'll be more than happy to sort of give you any guidance that we can um, in that regard. What type of assets are covered by the temporary full expensing deduction, Rebecca, if you don't mind? Uh, it's really any assets that you need for your business that exclude like capital improvements to your to the business so you can't go knock down some walls and put up some new walls and change those items that's not an asset um, for, for these purposes that's a capital improvement it's a capital works item which is still under separate rules yeah so the, the walls and those fixed fit outs the common one that i'm being asked about we're still only going to get that two and a half percent deduction on those um, but the dishwasher and the desks and those types of things you'll be able to get the full expensing of um, and jackie i understand there's a little bit of a quirk if you've got some of your assets pooled um, and the total of that pool how does that work Yes, that's right. So if you're a small business turnover of less than 10 million and you had a pool greater than 150 at 30 June 2020, you can now just write that full pool balance off. So we're probably likely to see in this year um, some big 
big pool write-offs under the um, temporary full expensing. Yeah. I do want to I do want to really emphasize that any of these items we're starting to get a little bit late in the year to buy some of these items because it's critical that they are installed and I think they have to have, have at least been used for one day or something or other Jackie they've got to be installed ready for use so I think the biggest um, sticking point might be for some people if you need new motor vehicles chances are you're not going to be able to order them and have them by 30 June just because of you know the, the lack on getting motor vehicles in the country at the minute. But if you've got equipment that you can purchase or you've got it on order and it's going to be installed and ready to use, then, yeah, you can get the deduction. But if you miss it this year, the good thing with those temporary full expensing is, is that they have been extended to 2023, June 23. Um, and I think that answers um, Adrian's question on the chat. Hi, Adrian. Hope you're well. Um, he's got a question there. It was mentioned a pre-purchase commitment was tax deductible. If I purchase a truck, pay for it by 30 June, but it only arrives by mid-July, would this be deductible? It'll be deductible, but not in this financial year. It won't be deductible until it arrives um, in the following year. Did I get that right, Jackie? Yep. Um, of course, probably the number two topic we talk about with tax planning is actually superannuation. Um, Rebecca, give us the quick snapshot around the super deductions that are available to people. Uh, it's not a quick snapshot, unfortunately, because there's lots of changes coming up for super. But at the moment, you're looking at superannuation contributions for your employees, um, first of all. So let's remember, they need to be paid and have not just left your account, but actually hit the super funds by 30 June for you to be able to claim a deduction for them. So I encourage you, if you're going to pay them, do that this week to make sure that it all goes through clearing houses and gets distributed out properly so that you can get a deduction. The, if you're looking at paying more contributions for yourself as a business owner or other people um, in the business, the contribution limits for a tax deduction this year is $25,000 per person. That includes any SGC, so the 9.5% that you've already paid. If you wanted to top that up um, with some non-concessional contributions, you can have a look at um, paying an additional $100,000 into superannuation as well. There are some bring forward rules on that. You need to talk to your financial planner or advisor to find out what you're eligible for. You can bring forward three years. We also have um, now um, an ability to go back and actually utilize some un, um, cap. Uh, if you've not used all of your caps in previous years, you can have a look back and maybe able to make some additional contributions. That goes back to, I believe, the 2019 financial year and can go for a maximum of five years. And I think that's a good one just to labor on it, just to reiterate for everybody out there. So if, if you're putting in $25,000 into super this year and you haven't put $25,000 in in the last two years, you can actually bring them forward and catch up on those years that you missed out on those tax deductible super contributions. This becomes really important for people, obviously when they get a little bit older and they're starting to think about superannuation a little bit more, but also when you might have um, something unusual going on within your, in your world, maybe you've sold your business and you've got a big capital gain and you wanna reduce it by some, some extra super contributions and, and, and different things like that. Of course, we've also got the increase in the superannuation guarantee rate, which will just flag for people, not really a tax planning question, um, but that kicks in at 1 July um, from 9.5% um, to 10% as well. So practically, Rebecca, you know, just to reiterate, that super for your employees and yourself has to hit the super fund before 30 June. Yeah. So what are you telling your clients to do? Are you telling them to bring forward a pay or do a part pay run or anything like that? Yeah, if our clients can quite confidently uh, calculate the amount of superannuation for their employees, some of them are bringing the full amount for the June period forward and paying that now. Um, otherwise, just a part payment to get as much through the door anyway. You're going to have to pay this in July. It's not that far out. If we can bring forward that deduction, take advantage of that, you know, slightly higher impact of a tax deduction this year, then that's what we're doing and trying to make sure that they all happen this week. And we're really just trying to um, align the tax deduction with, I suppose, the incurring of that expense. I know we've got a lot of real estate agents on the call here at the moment. That's a bit tricky when you're paying out commissions and different things like that. So what a lot of people might do is they might review when they do their commission runs or their pay runs, and they might bring, bring it forward a week. And maybe they don't get a deduction for that last week of super for the year, but they, they get three weeks worth paid and, um, and remitted across. One of the new things this year in doing um, our tax planning is what we call the loss carryback measures. 
Jackie, these have been talked about now for, I think, since the second last budget, or was it, it might have been the October 2020 the October budget, budget yeah. Talked about. yeah. But this is the first year that we can actually claim it. Can you explain to us quickly the loss carryback measures? Yeah, so if you had a, a tax loss in, so first and foremost, this applies to corporate structures only. So companies, um, if you had a loss in uh, the 30 June 2020 year or the 30 June 2021 year, like so you're going to have a loss this year, you can quantify those amounts, go back and apply them if you had taxable income in FY19 and you paid tax and you can get a refundable offset. So I think that's the key thing. It's going to work a little bit like the R&D um, offset where you'll get it refunded and reduce your tax in FY21 and a refund of a tax already paid. Um, the thing to note is that it is limited to um, tax that you've already paid. So you, in effect, your franking account balance. So if you paid a lot of tax in FY19 and then you went and paid out a, a big lump sum of frank dividends in FY20 or FY21, um, you will be limited to your franking account balance. It's hard to get um, too excited about the loss carryback rules, isn't it? Given so many people were out there and we're looking at their results. There's not many people making losses at the moment, um, but it's important for us to know for those that are, especially those that are in those industries that have, that have suffered a bit. Yeah, but they might have made a loss in 2020 and had a bit of a rebound in 2021. So that might be able to help offset some of the tax that they're going to pay in, in FY21. So I think that's, that's probably the key measure there. Yeah, good one. Yeah, um, John, sorry, can I just go back while we were on superannuation? I just wanted to circle back on something that Rebecca was talking about around employee super um, is just the um, increased activity in relation to super guarantee now that the amnesty period has finished. So um, I think it's a good, you know, opportunity to review your records if you've previously late paid superannuation or have some amounts of unpaid superannuation um, to fix it up get those super guarantee charge statements into the tax office and start negotiating with them because what you may not realize is there's a pretty hefty part of what they call a part seven penalty on short paid or late paid super and it's really draconian and the ATL being very restrictive as to where they will they will um, remit that to full so it can be yeah. 200 percent of the short paid super yeah it sounds like they're getting um a lot more aggressive in that regard and i think they want to raise some cats raise some money um staying on super and tax the other thing to keep in mind is what we call div 293 tax now div 293 tax is when your adjusted taxable income is more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars if it's over two hundred fifty thousand dollars and you've put twenty five thousand dollars into super your super fund effectively gets hit with an extra 15% tax. So the tax in the super fund effectively ends up being 30% instead of 15%. I've oversimplified the rules, but I just want to make sure people know that if you're in that $250,000 and up, that super contribution is not as beneficial as previously, but it is still beneficial. Anything you'd add to that, ladies? Yeah, I just want to add that you'll actually probably receive that notice in your own name initially and you have to fill in an election for the superannuation fund to pay it on your behalf. So uh, don't freak out if you do get it. Just call us and we'll help you through the next stages. A couple of other more normal things we always talk about every year um, is things like bad debts. Um, so if you've got someone that owes you money, this again, it assumes you're on an accruals basis of accounting for tax, someone owes you money and you know you're not going to recover that, um, you write that off before the end of the financial year so you effectively get a tax deduction. Jackie, what, how, does that, how does that become written off, I suppose? How would you describe um, the ability that you need to get it to, to be able to get that deduction? Yeah, so I think you've got to make a genuine attempt to recover the funds. Um, first of all, it's accruals, it's got to have been brought to account as income. Um, if it has gone bad, it's not just actually provisioning that it's doubtful, it's going, okay, we've made all of these attempts um, with the debtor to recover it, we may have taken some legal action, um, and we've made a decision pre-30 June that we're never going to recover those funds. So basically the directors can just, if it's a company or the trustee of the trust, just make a decision that they're going to write it off. I'd probably, you don't probably have to go to a formal um, you know, minute or resolution, but just somewhere documented that the directors have decided to write it off and then book it in the account. Is it enough that they just stop chasing it? Um, 
Yeah, probably. I mean, you don't have to tell the debtor that you're writing it off because, um, I mean, obviously you want the opportunity to be able to go and collect it at any stage or to continue to collect it. It's just by 30 June you've made a decision that you don't think it's going to be recoverable based yep. on the attempts you've made. Okay. One of the other common things that always comes up 30 June for those businesses that have stock is, of course, the need to do a stock take. Um, and of course, in doing a stock take, you're going to identify any obsolete stock so that you don't include that, include that within the closing stock balance, which means you're not getting taxed on stock that isn't actually of value to you anyway. Um, we do have some changes in tax rates sort of coming up. Rebecca, we've talked about the company tax rates going down last year from 27 and a half to 2021 at 26%, and then they go to 25%. I don't get too excited about that because of the flow on effect about franking credits, but do you want to explain that to our audience a little bit? The flow on effect of the franking yeah. credits? Yeah. So what will happen is once a tax rate goes down, then your entitlement to franking credits will actually reduce as well. So once we get into the next financial year and we're paying that 25% tax rate, any dividends that get paid out will also only um, have 25% franking credits attached. Now, we would have already been experiencing this over the last couple of years as the tax rates have progressively been dropping down from 30%. So I'd hope that everyone's at least partially familiar with that by now. So if we're talking about paying dividends out and you're taxed at 47%, you now will only get a 25% franking credit, which means the actual gap has actually increased and it's just moved the tax liability from the company to the individuals. Sounds really good. Um, a, a reduction in the company tax rate, especially if the money stays in the company, but it's less beneficial if you're taking all the money out and you're in the, in the top marginal tax rate. Anything you'd add to that, Jackie? No, I think that's a pretty good summary. Rebecca nailed it? Yes. <laughs> of course you did. And then we've got some changes in personal tax rates that I'd just like to flag for people to keep in the back of your mind. Um, we've had some fairly significant changes in personal tax rates in the last little while. But the next big change comes in in 2022, 2023 to 24, where, because um, I've got the tax rates on my screen here. Um, so in the 2022-23 year, they actually take out a whole threshold um, within the tax rate. So just keep an eye on the reduction in personal tax rates in the next couple of years will actually mean you can distribute some more out um, to yourselves as individuals. Now, talking about companies, talking about um, trusts and those types of things, I always say the ultimate tax planning strategy is to get your structure right, um, suitable for your business. Um, Jackie, can I, can I start with you and, and maybe ask very quickly, you know, what sort of businesses would suit a company structure or, or what type of situations would really suit a company structure? Yeah, I think if you're looking for a structure that you want to retain profits in, reinvest in working capital, um, you know, have the ability to potentially bring in um, staff, um, bring in other investors, then more and more we're seeing people operate a business through a corporate structure, particularly where you've got unrelated shareholders. Um, you, you, you generally see a, a corporate structure with maybe a, a family trust as the shareholder rather than the old, um, you know, unrelated parties in a business that might have gone into, say, a unit trust structure. Um, we're probably seeing a, a corporates used a little bit more with the lowering corporate tax rate. Do you concur with that, Rebecca? Yeah, absolutely. Companies are just becoming a lot more favourable to use to actually run a business through. I think the, the days of that... Um, look at setting up a business purely for the tax advantages, uh, which is where family trusts may have been used more heavily in the past uh, behind us, particularly when we start looking at some of the concessions that come out, recent um, concessions and grants that have come out have only been eligible effectively if you're in a corporate structure. Uh, so that even the ATO doesn't want us using family trusts anymore. Yeah, I agree. We're putting more and more um, people into, into companies and even investment entities. You know, having done some calculations now where the compound effect of a lower tax rate and the idea that you're not going to take the money out, you're going to continually invest it. We're seeing even people putting investment portfolios within companies at the moment um, and just and, and acknowledging that they don't get the capital gains tax discount. Um, yeah, the most common structure I see at the moment is a trading company with a trust as a shareholder, which gives us discretion to distribute income. Now, of course, 
Rebecca, if I can get you to give us, I suppose, a little bit of commentary on if you've got a trust, what's important that you must do before 30 June every year? Uh, if you have a discretionary trust, you have to be looking at getting your um, uh, distribution minutes finalised before 30, 30th of June. So that's having a look at the profits in the business and where you plan on distributing that to and minuting that so that um, we can action it at a tax time. And Jackie, I mean, what should we be keeping an eye out for in those trust distribution minutes? Yes, I think the key things are is, you know, do we want to be streaming, say, frank distributions um, to individual shareholders or potentially to a corporate beneficiary? If we've sold some assets, just some capital assets during the year, do we have a capital gain? Do we want to be streaming a capital gain to an individual to access the CGT discount? Um, yeah, it's just keeping it, you know, keeping an eye on some of those big uh, transactions that might have happened during the year that needs some special attention, um, particularly if you've sold a business because um, there's things that have to happen pre-30 June. If you, if you drop into those small business CGT concessions, um, there's a number of steps that have to take place pre-30 June. So I think if, if, if that's um, a trigger that's happened through the year, then speak to your advisor. Yeah. And of course, I mean, this, this idea of distributing um, to the kids, if they're over 18, those types of things, Jackie, I mean, that's completely legitimate, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I think the rule one in one with 101 with trusts is you've got to read the deed. Are they eligible beneficiaries under the deed? Um, generally, your, your family trust, the way that they're set up, will have brought, like broad beneficiary classes. But I think it's always a good idea to get your advisor to check that you can actually distribute to your kids, particularly if you've got blended family and you've got stepchildren or adopted children and all those sorts of things. Um, and yeah, look, if, you, if they're over 18 um, and you can distribute to them, I think that's probably the most tax advantage way. But the thing to remember is, is that those distributions have to actually go to those individuals. Um, if there are agreements where you're distributing to those individuals and they're not actually getting the benefit of those funds, um, you could run into some issues. And that is an area that the ATO is looking at the moment. So what we kind of recommend to clients is, is if you're using your adult children to distribute funds to, but you're also supporting their lifestyle, like potentially buying them vehicles or back when we could travel overseas and you're paying for their overseas holidays um, or your, yeah, new vehicles, holidays, uni fees, is that you keep a list of all of that stuff and you can actually, you know, maybe either pay it out of the family trust so that it's reducing their beneficiary entitlement, um, but not just, you know, randomly offsetting things because you might, you might run into issues. Yeah, good. Um, of course, a trust, if you are a trading entity and you are in a trust or maybe you've got a big game within a trust, one of the biggest tax planning strategies is to distribute to what we call a bucket company, um, which is a company that um, might only get the 30% tax rate, um, but could allow you to sort of park it in there at that 30% rate. Now, if that cash then follows into that company, um, then you don't have anything else to worry about. But if the cash doesn't follow into that company, we do have to worry about some rules, which we call the Division 7A rules. Now, these apply not only when you distribute to a bucket company, but when you borrow money out of a company just generally. Um, Jackie, can I get you to give us the, the, the headline sort of description of Division 7A? And I suppose most importantly, what do we need to do now before 30 June? Yeah, so very high level Div 7A covers where you're extracting profits out of a company in a tax event form. I think that's at its bare minimum. That's what it is. So if you're loaning it or you're distributing it to it and that cash isn't flowing, um, we need to put it on terms. So usually seven years um, where you're paying a minimum repayment over seven years and you're paying a benchmark interest rate. Now, that benchmark interest rate has come down over um, recent years because it is linked to the reserve bank rate. Um, so I think it's circa about four, four and a half percent at the moment. So still higher than probably what the banks are lending at, um, but it's, it's still a fairly minimal interest rate at the moment. So the company has to receive some interest income and get a minimum repayment um, on that loan or that um, unpaid present entitlement. Um, and the trust or the individual who's borrowed the funds will have some some interest um, payable. Now, whether that's deductible will depend on what you've used the funds for. So if you've used the funds to reinvest back in the business or you've used it to put an investment portfolio or property, then great, you've probably got some deductibility. But if you've used it to renovate your home or go on a holiday, then not likely interest deductibility on the other side. Anything you'd add to that, Rebecca, from a, uh, as we get to 30 June perspective around Division 7A? 
No, I think Jackie covered that quite well, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Make sure you've of- met your minimum repayments. Yes. Yeah, and they could just- be paid by way of, of dividends, though, so you don't necessarily have to cash flow those back into the back into the company. Mind you, if you've got some spare cash and you've got a Division 7A loan sitting there, if you contributed that money into the company before 30 June, that would be considered a, a, a repayment of that loan. Certainly will, so long as you don't pull it straight back out. Yes, of course. Um, other general tax planning strategies, one of the most common ones is, of course, negative gearing. Um, probably not such an issue these days because we're actually seeing a lot of rental properties being more positively geared with interest rates being low and those types of things. Um, Rebecca, I know you've got a stack of investors, sort of clients and so forth. What are the key things around, I suppose, rental properties generally? Um, just making sure that you do keep track of any expenses that you have on the property. And if it's a new property to you or a property that you've had before and haven't sorted out yet, have a look at getting a depreciation report done. This needs to be done by um, a quantity surveyor. You can't just knock up your own and we can't do it for you. We can refer you to the right place if you if you want a referral for one. Um, the cost of getting the report done is also tax deductible, but that will increase your deductions over the period of time that you're renting the property out. Um, and is looks at um, a deduction in you know the the value of the building and different items inside the building like the kitchen and bathrooms and all these different items and gives you an amount that you can claim in your tax return so get your quantity surveyor report what about if it's the beach house and i maybe go and use it every now and then what do we need to do in that regard rebecca keep a diary <laughs> Keep a diary, private use adjustment to any of your expenses. Right. And not just um, a diary as well on that end that when you've used it, evidence that you're at, it's actually available for rent external and where you're advertising that when you're renting it out and just making sure that we can see that you're actually having that sometimes holiday home actually rented out to the general public. Yeah, and I suppose another point I would emphasise there because I keep getting asked about this one is you can no longer get a tax deduction for travelling to your rental property. Um, And I know there used to be a lot of people, let's just say they lived in, let's just say Karen from Brighton lived in Melbourne and she had a beach house at Noosa. She used to claim her flight to go to Noosa to inspect her rental property and then went and had a holiday around the corner. Um, They've pretty much just cut any travel, even kilometres, cents per kilometre claim to inspect your rental property is no longer deductible for us. When we look at personal tax returns, there's some some common, I suppose, tax deductions that we see out there. The common ones are things like income protection insurance. Make sure you've got your donations. Um, Cars is usually a big one. Um, Jackie, logbooks, what are the logbook requirements, I suppose, around cars that people need to know about? Yeah, so just making sure that you maintain a logbook. Um, 12, week, 12 weeks is the minimum period, so long as that's representative of the travel that you're doing throughout the year. Um, if you've only um, kept it for, say, the last five or six weeks of the year, it can carry into the next year and you can use it for this year, so long as it is sort of a representation of what you've travelled in this year. Um, I think maybe just a point to note is that there probably is an expectation that there's going to be reduced travel due to COVID, particularly if you've been working from home. Um, So if you are in a situation where you may be doing more travel because you were going to client premises rather than them coming to you, um, is just make sure that you've got that diarised and documented that you do have an increase because I think the blanket across the ATO is probably going to be an expectation that that has reduced. That five rounds, five years seems to come around really quickly, though, doesn't it? With the logbook, that's like right. Yeah, like five years. Another one every five years as a minimum. Um, last year, they gave the tax office gave us a concession around home office expenses because of COVID. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's been extended through to 30 June 2021. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, the other thing I emphasise, which people often forget about, is that if you intend to claim a super deduction in your personal tax return, you need to actually notify your fund that you are claiming that tax deduction. Most of the industry funds have a bit of a standard form that you can you can fill out um, in that regard. I've got a couple of questions on the q and I'll get to in a moment, but just to sort of start to wrap us up, um, anything else sort of coming into play 1 July next year, guys, that people should be keeping an eye out for? Uh, We have not only an increase in SGC to 10% um, for employees, we also have an increase in the um, upper caps. So if you want to make deductible super contributions next year, that cap's going up to 27,500 and the non-concessional cap's going up to 110,000. Yeah, okay, good. 
Um, and of course, we've got STP kicking in for um, closely held um, employees now as well. So if you've got an entity and it's just a mum and dad in there getting wages, that needs to be reported through single touch payroll as well. Um, Jackie, I know ATO is doing a lot more data matching um, in, in their systems and they had a whole revamp of their IT systems a little while ago, which I assume is to enable them to, to do this a, a, a lot better. Is there any, I suppose, words of advice or tips um, that you, you'd share with people for them to take into account in preparing their tax return this year? Yes, I think it's just being careful that you've got all of it documented. So, I mean, most recently we've had clients with foreign income that they haven't reported. So making sure that's included because just a reminder that, you know, Austrac do track monies coming into the country. So, um, and the ATO do data match with Austrac. So that's probably one of them. Motor vehicles with state registration boards. Um, they monitor um, anything that you put your tax file number in, so bank interest or investments. Um, so their data matching is actually quite sophisticated. So um, look, if you forget something, most often, often it is picked up on the pre-fill report, but I think it's just having a think about, you know, investments that you might have um, and just making sure that we've, we've got them reported. Um, Another one of those is if you've sold a property or sold shares is that um, the ATO data match that as well and capital gains tax is based on contract date, not settlement date. So you might sell it in June, but you don't get the funds to July. So you think, okay, well, I don't need to report that till the next financial year, but it's actually it's actually this year that you've got to report it. So just contract keeping that date. in the back of your mind. Yeah, absolutely. It's a good reminder, that one. Yeah, course, when it's capital gains, because obviously we've got some property developers where it's different if it's if it's trading stock and development. So if you if you're running a business, it's it's different. It's settlement date, but certainly if it's a capital capital. Asset. Well, the same applies for shares and things, doesn't it? You know, if you're yeah. buying, if you've made some capital gains during the year on shares, it's contract date as to what year it puts them into. Um, often before 30 June, if you've got a big gain and you want to realise some losses, you might realise them in the same year. So they so they offset each other. But of course, that's got an investment decision in there as well. Just want to circle back around to Rebecca buying her Maserati um, <laughs> and, the, and the data matching that the ATO does, you know, um, you'd be surprised what data they are matching. And, you know, if they see you gone out there and bought the Maserati, Rebecca, but then you've reported in your tax return quite a low taxable income, um, expect an audit at some point in time. Would you agree? Absolutely. And those audits start with this really fun um, exercise where they means test you because they want to understand how you were able to actually afford that Maserati in the first place. So yeah, if you're making lavish purchases, they're watching you. <laughs> um, what the tax office always has some different industries or different areas of the tax system that they like to keep some attention on or keep a close eye on. Jackie, what would you say are the areas that the ATO is focusing on at the moment? Oh, look, I think cash economy is always one that they're focusing on. They've actually got a task force that um, deals with the cash economy. Um, so I think that's probably it. Contractors, I think we were talking about this yesterday, like if you've got the gig economy and or contractors, say Uber drivers or Deliveroo or things like that, or if you've got income that you think is a hobby, they're probably data matching in that area as well. Yeah, I think that gig economy and contract one, especially for our real estate clients that are, that are on the webinar at the moment, I know some of you like using independent contractors with your, with your salespeople. Keep a close eye on um, the Deliveroo case, which is challenging the treatment of one of their um, food delivery drivers as to whether they're a contractor or an employee. Consequences of that will be tax related, they'll be super related, they'll be fair work related. Um, I, I actually um, helped write an article for Elite Agent on that. You can see that on our website um, if you're interested in that specifically for, for the real estate industry, but the overall use of contractors generally. Rebecca, any other areas you, you're aware of that the ATO is focusing on or looking at at the moment? Well, rental property is something that they're having a look at again this year, along with um, cryptocurrency. So a lot of people have made some money in crypto over the last couple of years and thinking that because it's not real money, there's no tax consequences, unfortunately. We have to pay tax on that. We do, we do. And depending on what you're doing with it, there's different kinds of taxes you could be paying on it. Um, if you're actively trading it or using it in your business, it could potentially be resulting in income tax consequences. Otherwise, if um, it's on a capital account, same as if you were buying or selling shares on a capital account, there's CGT consequences. 
Yeah, and, and the other area I'd say the ATO is always looking at is professional services. But recently they withdrew one of their rulings um, around um, taxation for professional services. Um, so we don't really have clarity yet on their final position. Not if I'm correct, Jackie. Um, but so still watch out for um, making sure that professional services are attributing a fair portion of any profits that they make from their partnership or their or their practice um, to the actual individuals to acknowledge their their contract contribution um, in there. We've got a couple of questions I want to circle around to. We've got one here from Chris. Is the government super co-contribution especially complicated? Either of you ladies like to answer that one, co-contribution. I've, I've had very little application of it. It's, maybe that's because it's so complicated. I don't think it's excessively complicated. However, the amount's only about $500. So I think that what we're, we're not really having a lot of people who are eligible for it, which is why it doesn't come up a lot on our end. Yep. eligibility criteria is actually quite tough. Got a question here from Michelle. Thanks for joining us, Michelle. What options does a services business have to minimise company tax outside of asset purchases, deferring income, bringing forward expenses and additional super contributions? She's probably hit the top four there, hasn't she? Yeah, and I think the, probably the answer to that is, is you probably, if you're running a business, um, you're probably already in the ultimate structure anyway because you've got corporate tax rate of 26%, um, ability to pay you know, probably pay frank dividends out to your trust structure and, and potentially stream to lower marginal tax rates. So you're probably already optimising in that structure anyway. And I think, you know, the old adage is, is I'd never recommend anyone to run out and buy something just for a tax deduction. I think mm. it's just making sure that if there is something that you can bring forward or you can defer legitimately, um, then, then take advantage of it to give you the timing benefit. I guess the time value of money is that tax money is better in your pocket than the than the government. Never makes sense to spend a dollar for a, a maximum forty seven cent tax deduction, does it? If no. you're not going to spend that money anyway, from a business perspective. Yeah, if it doesn't make business sense, don't do it. Yeah, business first. Sean's got a question. When you mentioned franking account balance, at what date? I think this might have been when we were talking about the loss carry back, the date the yeah. tax return is lodged, or the end of the financial year. Yeah, so franking account is always at the end of the financial year. So I think if, I ha apologies, I haven't looked at those loss carryback rules in significant detail, but I imagine when you're prepping your 30 June 2021 return, it'll be whatever your franking balance is at that date, um, is that that loss carryback will be limited to that amount because that's usually how your franking account works is it's usually at a 30 June date. You can go into deficit during the year, so long as by the end of the year, being 30 June, if 30 June to a year end, that it, that it is still in a credit position. And importantly, your franking account balance is worked out based on the actual date of payment of tax. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So um, you'll see that, you know, some people who maybe want more franking credits within their franking account so they can pay a frank dividend out might be trying to pull forward some tax deductions, um, some tax payments, sorry, to bulk up that franking account balance. But there has to be... Um, like a legal liability to pay. So if you've if you've lodged a 2020 tax return and you've got an unpaid tax debt there, you could you could pay that. Um, or if you've had the ability to vary instalments up to increase your amount, but there has to be a legal liability. There. It may sort of be too late because you would have been able to vary your March instalment potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I might direct this last question at you, Rebecca, if you don't mind, from Mark Peterson. In terms of structuring, would you take a trust over a company in relation to the 50% general discount? Probably worth just explaining the difference there. That is um, such a can of worms, that question. <laughs> it's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm not super excited about answering that straight away. But when I'm running a business, I basically never want to put it in a trust under any circumstances, potentially a unit trust, but definitely not um, a discretionary trust. Most of the um, the advantages to a family trust are totally outweighed by the advantages of having a company, even when looking at the CGT um, on, a, on, a, on a max end as well. When the company tax rate is only 25%, it's, you know, is it really that different to um, CGT discount potentially if someone has a high marginal rate anyway? That's probably what I would be looking at. Yeah, I, I, you go, Jackie. I was just going to say in a business context, we're seeing more and more um, businesses, particularly if you're being bought out by private equity or bigger, larger corporates, is we are seeing a lot more of an appetite where it's a share sale, which, you know, if the trust owns the shares and you potentially can get CGT discount on those. Um, we're seeing a much more appetite in that area rather than an asset sale where you wouldn't get CGT discount. So 
I think certainly business structuring, um, I'm seeing much more in a corporate structure. Um, I mean, I still have a passion for trusts. I think they still have their place. Um, I think you've just got to, you know, have a discussion around what your long-term goals are and, and work out what the best structure is. Yeah, I, I think people underestimate the value of being able to retain, being, retain income in a company and retain it and be taxed at that what will soon be 25% tax rate as compared to a trust that you've got no control over the income coming out and it must come out and you must distribute it somewhere. And so the only times I'll put business um, um, in a trust would be if it had a very short-term focus, maybe five years or less, and the strategy is, tr- is classically to build and sell within that five years and make a big capital gain on the sale of the business rather than on the sale of shares within a company that operates that business. That's probably the only circumstance I'm seeing it. But as I said before, even people are even doing investments through companies now and willing to waive the 50% CGT discount to get the company tax rate and the big proviso on that as long as you don't intend to make a gain and then take that cash out, in which case you'd have the catch up tax to 47% potentially. You wanna add anything to that, Rebecca? No, all good, John, you did it well. (laughs) Guys, um, thank you very much everybody for joining us. Um, Keep an eye out, we'll have an update to our tax planning blog go out again soon. Any of our real estate agents that are online, if you go onto our blog, you'll see we've updated our top tax tactics for the real estate industry. Um, You can download that ebook. That's for salespeople, for employees and business owners within there. That's pretty much got everything summarized specifically for the real estate industry. Parting words from from each of you ladies to um, give everyone that final word of advice before we approach 30 June. Rebecca, I'll start with you. Uh, if, when we're looking at your personal circumstances, let's not rush to do taxes in 2021. No, um, knowing like what Jackie was talking about around data matching, we should really be waiting until all the information is available everywhere before jumping in and finalising tax returns this year. Yeah, good one. Jackie, final word of advice? Um, speak to your accountant if you've had some of those trigger points. Come and speak to us if you've got any concerns around structuring. Um, but I think just... just ha- turn your mind in the next few weeks as to anything that might have occurred that you think will impact your tax planning because it's better to try to deal with it now than after the fact. Absolutely. You've got a better chance of saving some tax if you deal with it now rather than after yeah. the event. Um, and I suppose my final word of advice would be to watch out for the double whammy of tax. We're seeing a lot of businesses out there getting some really good results at the moment. So when you lodge your next tax return, and if that's got a big increase in profits or big increase in taxable income and you have a bigger tax payable, you're then going to get an increase in your quarter PAYG installments as well. So in a, in a rising economy with rising profits, um, that next tax return you log could trigger a double whammy of tax where you won't only pay the catch up for 2021, you'll start having to pay a much bigger amount for 2022. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Of course, a good accountant will be setting that out for you within your tax timeline um, on a regular basis so that you know that it's coming. Guys, um, thank you very much for attending today. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Rebecca. You can stay up to date with anything else we have to share around tax planning or anything else tax related at businessdepot.com.au. You can, of course, um, subscribe to our newsletter um, on the website as well. Um, But you will also get a a copy of this recording for you to reflect back on anything else you might be able to do. We would love to say there's some amazing tactics and amazing sort of tricks to reduce your tax. Um, But unfortunately... Um, they've closed most of those sort of fun things. Um, and what we've got here today is really, I suppose, uh, a, a practical view on what we can do to plan for your tax for 2021. Thanks for joining us, everyone.